Hello there, Mr. Sutton here, bringing you this BC Calculus 618 lesson on logistic growth. In this one, we will be determining the upper bound on a population and when the population is growing fastest for functions that can be described with a logistic model. So to start this off, for a warm-up, let's say that someone starts a rumor at Air Shirley High School, which has 400 students, that Mr. Sutton will be doing a karaoke panther block during the fourth quarter. OMG, you don't say. Sketch a graph of the number of students who know the rumor after T hours. Uh, so here's a set of grid lines for you to use. And just note that the internet is down. So there's no way you're going to be able to communicate with anyone outside the high school. We're only keeping track of students. We don't care how many adults know this. We're just graphing the number of students who know the rumor. All right, let's see if we came up with a similar graph. So initially, this is going to be growing exponentially. One student tells another student. They tell more students. More and more students get told. Um, it keeps getting multiplied by, you know, some number of students that everybody's telling every single hour. Things are great. But at some point, we're going to reach a time when people have already heard the rumor, when some of the people who are getting told the rumor already knew it. And we're going to start flattening out in terms of this growth rate. What's the highest this can ever grow? Well, there's only 400 students in the building. So at most, only 400 students can ever know this rumor, at least in the time that we have here. Um, so at some point, this has to flatten out as we approach 400. So we could say that then there is an asymptote at 400. And if you think about it, there must be one at zero as well, because as you go back in time, you're never going to be able to get below zero students knowing this rumor. You might not even be able to get below one. I guess it depends on, on whether they, you know, what, what you count as your starting number of people. Um, anyway, this is called a logistic graph. This is an S-shaped function whose growth rate starts out exponential, but then zeroes out as the function's value approaches some limiting value. That limiting value, 400 in this particular problem, is called the carrying capacity. Now, other key features of this graph that are sort of neat, you'll notice about halfway between uh, the, the two asymptotes here, half of the carrying capacity, around 200, we have an inflection point. And we already noted there are two asymptotes, two horizontal asymptotes on this graph. So this is one of the rare functions that's not a piecewise function, but still has these two different horizontal asymptotes. Now that we've seen a graphical representation of logistic functions, let's take a look at the uh, differential equation and the algebraic end of it. So the differential equation description of a logistic function. Over time, a positive quantity p grows at a rate proportional to itself. Um, so this is pretty similar to what we saw with exponential growth. And we could write this part as dp over dt equals kp, so proportional to its current level. And this is the, differ this is the logistic part, and its distance from a carrying capacity m. Um, so we could represent this part as m minus p. So just to go back to the example we looked at on the last slide, we have the number, the rate at which a rumor is growing is proportional to the number of students who know it. Um, so that's the KP part. And the number of students who don't know the rumor, that's the M minus P, the number of students in the school building minus the number who currently know the rumor. So this is what the differential equation looks like for a logistic function. We're also going to take a look at the general solution for this. Now, what follows is a huge derivation of that general solution. Um, feel free to follow along, or if you want to skip to the end of all that, that's fine too. But if you're curious where the end result of all of it comes from, uh, that's what we're going into now. So if we want to solve this, and it's good diffie Q practice anyway, right? We need to separate our variables. So the P and the M minus P need to get divided to the other side to be under the DP. And then the DT is going to come up with the K. So there's our first setup. And now we're going to have to integrate both sides. Uh, we'll integrate the right side a little bit later on. It's not going to be that difficult. But the left side is going to take some work. In order to integrate this left side, we're going to need to use partial fractions. So let me set up this, uh, this fraction here in my partial fraction format. So I can write 1 over p times m minus p is equal to 1 over p, or we'll call it actually a over p, plus b over m minus p. So I've split the two factors up, and they've all got their, their magical constant that makes this all work. OK, so now we'll multiply both sides by p and m minus p. That'll leave me with 1 on the left side. And on the right side, I've got a times m minus p plus b times p. 
at this rate, I'm gonna, or at this point, I'm gonna pick a value for p, a convenient value, that's gonna let me solve for a and b. So let's say that I wanna solve for a. So I wanna have a, a p value that gets rid of my b over here. I'm gonna pick a p value of zero. If I plug zero in for p, then this term gets zeroed out, and I can write one equals a times m minus zero. And if one equals a times m minus zero, then uh, a is just gonna equal one over the m here. Next, I wanna figure out the value of b. So I'm gonna pick a p-value that's gonna zero out this first term. I'm gonna pick a p-value of m, because if I have m minus m here, I'll have zero. So if p equals m, then I can write one equals uh, b times m, which means b is also going to equal one over m. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, let's uh, turn this fraction now back into a, a, a addition of fractions, a sum of two fractions. So we're gonna rewrite this as, and, and this is the integral on the left side now, we're gonna have one over m over p plus one over m over m plus minus p. So we're integrating that, we've got a dp for that whole integral, and we'll also be integrating that right side. And we'll do all of this on the very next slide. All right, so let's finish this solution. Um, congratulations if you're still with us. You must really want to know where that general solution comes from. So for our next step, integrating each of these, these are both going to be uh, ln, absolute values of these things. Now since p is a positive number, and presumably m is as well, um, we don't need the absolute value for this. So we can write this as 1 over m, just ln of p, no absolute value needed, plus 1 over m, ln of parentheses m minus p, and then over here on the right side, we finally get to integrate k. That's going to be uh, just, since k is a constant, this is just going to be kt. And then we have that plus constant over there. Uh, we'll call this c1 for now. Now, why am I calling it c1 instead of just c? Well, you, you will see, no pun intended. Um, so let's keep going here. I have to, at some point, isolate p. That's what I'm trying to do here. So a whole bunch of algebra happens. I'm going to multiply both sides by m to get rid of these fractions. And while I'm on the left side as well, I'm going to merge these lns together. Since I'm subtracting these logs, I'm dividing the stuff inside. So on the left side then, I just have ln of quantity p over m minus p. And then on the right side, I've just multiplied everything by m. So I have m kt plus, um, I could call this mc1 but I'm gonna call it C2 instead. It's just some other constant, because M is a constant. It's the carrying capacity. All right, let's keep going. So next, I have to raise E to both sides. So that's just gonna cancel out the L on the, LN on the left side. So I have P over M minus P. And on the right side, I have E to the M K T plus C2. Um, but now I can split up that E uh, into e to all this stuff plus e to the c2. But rather than writing e to the c2, I'm just gonna make that e to the c2 and a c3. It's just some other constant. Um, you can see where this is going. We just keep changing this constant into some other constant. All right, so moving forward then, still trying to solve for p, not there yet. I'm gonna have to multiply both sides by m minus p. So if I do that, I have p on the left side and I've got m times all this stuff minus p times all this stuff, and then still got to isolate p, so I'm going to add this uh, minus p c3 e to the mkt to the left side to get all the p terms together. Next, just like when we're solving or we're doing uh, implicit differentiation, that's the one I'm thinking of, um, we're going to factor out a p, leaving us with one plus all this stuff without the p. Then we're gonna divide everything by this craziness here. And here's the crazy looking expression we have. Now we're gonna go a little bit further with this because although we do have P isolated, um, this doesn't look as fancy as the general solution that you're gonna see in textbooks. So let's show, show you how you get there. I'm gonna divide for whatever reason both of these parts of our fraction by this constant times E to the MKT. So basically reduce it by that. Now in the numerator, that's gonna leave me with just uh, m. 
And in the denominator, I'm going to have 1 over all this stuff, plus, conveniently, 1. I'm going to go a little bit further and simplify this a little bit more. So I'm going to have m over. And then here, I can write this as 1 over c3 times e to the negative mkt. And I'm going to write this 1 first, just because it looks like what you have in textbooks. But now this 1 over c3, I don't really like that either. I'm going to make that yet another constant. I'm going to call it a this time, just to be different. And then we have e to the negative mkt. So this is what logistic functions look like if you just see the function itself and not the differential form of it. Um, and that's how you get there. Now that we've uh, talked all about the differentialness and uh, general solutions for the logistic function, um, we're going to actually apply it to a real problem. Now, thankfully, applying logistic functions is a lot easier than figuring out what the general solution is. Um, and this, this kind of problem is the task you will generally see on the AP exam. So we have a growth rate of a population P of bears, the bears, in a newly established preserve modeled by this differential equation. Um, I would say 99 times out of 100, you're going to see the differential version of logistic functions, which is good because this is a lot easier to work with. Um, and T is measured in years. Okay, we want to know the carrying capacity for bears in this wildlife preserve. So based on what we've already talked about with differential equations um, and logistic functions specifically, see if you can figure out what our carrying capacity should be. All right, so the, the easy thing is the carrying capacity is just whatever P is being subtracted from inside this parentheses, at least if it's in this form. If we're already in KP, parentheses, M minus P form, then our carrying capacity is just going to be the M, which in this case is 100. So what that means is that 100 bears, that's the upper limit on this preserve in terms of uh, no matter how long these bears are going on, they're never going to get higher than 100. All right, next question. What is the bear population when the population is growing the fastest? Now, at first glance, this seems like we're, at, we're asking you to find the time at which the population is growing the fastest and then to plug that in to find the bear population. But this differential equation, they did not do anything with t. Um, all we have here is the input is p, the population, and the growth rate is the output. So in a situation like this, if we want to figure out where the population is growing the fastest, we kind of have to know something about the logistic function itself. Let's look back at our graph that we made earlier of that logistic function for the, uh, the rumor. So looking at our logistic curve, it looks like we are increasing the fastest at this inflection point that is exactly half the carrying capacity. So in general then, we're going to be growing the fastest whenever uh, p equals half of the carrying capacity, which is very easy to calculate mathematically. Take a sec to do that. OK, so we're growing fastest when p equals 50. And we wanted to know the bear population when the population is growing the fastest. So that actually directly answers the question they were asking. Cool. All right, let's move on to the last one. What's the rate of change of the population when it's growing the fastest? So again, the rate of change, we're given that by the differential function here. All we have to know is the population, plug it in, and that'll give us the rate of change back. So if we plug in 50 for all of the p-values, and we had 100 still for that carrying capacity, and crunch the numbers here, that'll give us the rate of change. So let's do that on the calculator now. So I've plugged all that in, and I get an answer of 20. So what is my units here? Well, this is the rate of change of the population measured in bears per, let's see, they said that t was measured in years. So this would be 20 bears per year. For our next and last example, we're going to do a little wombat fever here. Uh, we have a logistic equation below describing the growth of a population of wombats, p, where t is measured in years. And this is only for uh, t values greater than 0. And they want us to figure out the following items based off of this. We want to know the limit as t approaches infinity of p, at what p value p of t has a point of inflection, and if p of 0 equals 100, at what times is p of t greater than 0. So first thing to realize is we are not in our standard kp times m minus p form. We're pretty close. We have some constant times a p, and we have some number minus something with a p, but the, the p isn't by itself. This isn't just p. This is p over 50. So we're going to start by factoring out whatever we need to 
to put this in the true kp m minus p form. So to get p to be uh, p over 50 to be p, I would have to factor a 1 50th out of all of this. If I take out a 1 over 50, on the outside, that's just going to be 80 over 50 p. And on the inside, well, obviously, this will be p. That's what we were trying to do all along. But this 20, what's 20 if I factor a 1 50th out of it? Well, if I factor out a 1 50th, I'm really dividing 20 by 1 50th, which means I'm really multiplying 20 by 50. So this is going to be 1,000 minus p inside. OK, so now we've got it in that form that we like to use. And we're going to go through and try these questions. Um, so just for kicks and giggles here, pause the video and see how many of these you can figure out on your own based on what you've learned so far. All right, so this first one, limit as t approaches infinity of p of t. We don't know how, we don't have any t variable represented in here. This is another one where you really have to know what the logistic function itself is doing, um, regardless of what the differential equation looks like. All of these logistic functions, as the time goes on and on and on, they're going to be approaching your carrying capacity. So in this case, that would be the carrying capacity of 1,000 wombats. For this next one, at what p value does p of t has a, have a point of inflection? Um, well, again, if you know what the graph looks like, you know that point of inflection always happens at half the carrying capacity. So we just have to divide 1,000 by 2 to get 500 wombats. So, so far, these two questions have been exactly like the two questions that we had on the last example, the, the first two questions, except that they were asked a little bit differently. Instead of asking for the carrying capacity explicitly, we put it in kind of, we dressed it up in limit speak. Instead of asking where the, pot, the rate was growing the fastest, we asked for a point of inflection. But it's really the same question in disguise. Now, this last one's going to be a little different. If p, equals zero, or equal, if p of 0 equals 100, at what times is p prime of t positive? Um, so for this one, we're asking where we have a positive growth rate. Now, if you're starting below the carrying capacity, again, looking back at our logistic function graph, if you're starting below the carrying capacity, then because it's logistic growth, you're just going to grow and grow and grow. I mean, you're flattening out here, but you're always growing. You're just never quite getting there. So if we're starting below carrying capacity, we're always growing, which means that we would be going from, in this case, zero to infinity. Now, they had to specify that we're starting below our carrying capacity. Um, they said p of 0 equals 100, and that's less than our carrying capacity of 1,000. But what would happen if you started above the carrying capacity? What if you were up here somewhere? Well, because you've got a horizontal asymptote, you would actually be decreasing forever to approach that asymptote. Um, so you might be thinking, well, why would you be starting above the carrying capacity? I don't know. Maybe they... Uh, in this rumor problem, maybe they threw a bunch of students into the school, and yeah, I, don't, I don't even know. It doesn't really make a lot of sense in terms of real-life situations, but mathematically, you would be decreasing all the time instead of increasing. So that's it for logistic growth. Till next time, Mr. Sutton signing off.